now we're going to have a couple of founder talks again. So if you're standing around there, there is plenty of room in the seats uh, in this area and there. So please have a seat. Please have a seat. Some people are leaving. This is okay. They go to the boring stage, which is a blue stage. Yellow stage is anyway more imp uh, important and interesting. So the next person up um, on the stage is Marie Oller. She uh, was studying in China when she was 22. And um, she was offered an internship at Estonian Embassy in China. And what happened there was that on her first day when she went there, uh, the ambassador went to a sudden annual leave. So she had to take over the whole embassy by herself. Please give a big applause to Marie. And put 60 minutes on, please. Hi, everybody. It's um, great to be home. Um, I didn't burn down the embassy, in case you were wondering. It's still functional. Um, so I am currently Chief Services Officer at um, Alpha Audiotronics. We make a product called SkyBuds. And this is a truly wireless um, earbuds. So, but what we're really doing is actually building the next generation computing platform. We believe that there's going to be a day when you're going to put one of those things in your ear, and it's going to be your assistant through the day and help you with information, with well-being, and sort of everything you need. So that's our big, hairy vision. Um, I'm here also as a founder. Um, the reason why I'm at SkyBuds is that SkyBuds actually acquired my last startup, which was called Scarlet, and we were building an intelligent assistant. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today, more than my life story, is actually some of the things that I've found helpful as an entrepreneur. Um, so entrepreneurship is really hard, as everybody knows, and I think there are certain things that I've learned personally that I've become, that's become helpful to me. Um, we could spend probably, you know, days on every topic, but I'll try to get through this like 10 minutes, and maybe we can have a discussion after that. Um, so the three th things are finding your flavor of entrepreneurship, because I believe that there are many ways to be involved. Secondly, building your expertise. And thirdly, creating an ecosystem for success. Um, so talking about the first one, and entrepreneurs, how many of you in the audience are uh, founders? OK, uh, keep your hands up. Um, how many have, are working at an early stage startup, not as a founder, but part of a team? OK, and how many people have started a new venture in an existing organization? Right, so you're all entrepreneurs, as far as I'm concerned. Um, everybody, when they think about entrepreneurs, is thinking about the founders. And, you know, that's what our talk is about. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the other folks who I'm calling joiners, for lack of a better word, right now. And these are all the folks who are joining early stage ventures along with a the founder. They're there for the ride, through the ups and downs, and through the whole journey. And why I think it's important is because for founders to recognize that the people who join you, um, they also have this entrepreneurial mindset. They want to, you know, change the world, get involved with something new, build something new, you know, change people's lives. Um, and they're likely going to be founders one day themselves. And the second point is that it is actually training ground for founders. So one really great way to get involved in entrepreneurship is to join an early stage venture, whether you're doing it in a you know, brand new startup or you're doing it actually within the new venture of an existing organization. And you, know, you basically get to make the mistakes and learn a lot on someone else's dime because entrepreneurship can also be very expensive um, financially for yourself. So you get to understand how to build a product, how to get it to market, pivot if necessary, and also, if you're really lucky, to actually see the company all the way to acquisition or IPO. All right, so how did I get started? So I think everybody knows the sort of stereotype of my first lemonade stand when I was four years old. In my case, it was actually selling wildflowers uh, in the beach town of Paterno in Estonia out of my friend's parents' summer house. Um, it's cute, but in practice, it's not going to get you funded. So if we talk about you know, real first entrepreneurial venture, um, I was a joiner. So I joined Virgin Mobile in New York when it was still a small startup. It was about 150 people. They've done a couple of rounds of funding. And I had a chance to basically build a mobile commerce platform. 
So I got to figure out kind of what the product was, um, create the business case, work with everybody from marketing to IT to, uh, to en you know, engineering to really build a product and then launch that to market. And it actually had a pretty big role in Virgin Mobile's IPO story. And that's really what set me up for my next venture. So I become an, became an entrepreneur. I went to Nokia and I was part of a, an emerging markets team. And we, Nokia had just bought Navtech, and Navtech is you know big mapping company, had all these assets. But we had also a massive emerging markets phone portfolio. And this was you know, tiny phones with tiny screens, no GPS, and we said, okay, so what should we do in mapping? And I really liked that idea. And I basically said, hey, let me go and figure this out. So I created kind of like the whole pitch for the business and uh, got a you know, shoestring budget and went off to build a team. So I ended up building a team in Bangalore, India, and in Berlin, Germany. And we grew it to 100 people, 100 people across Europe and Asia. And, um, and we launched a portfolio of, of mapping applications on these feature phones. And it became 10 million monthly user business in less than two years. So it was extremely successful in, in commercial in that sense. But I would say I would really credit my experience at Virgin to really teach me how to think about creating a new business and launching that. So, you know, different flavors of entrepreneurship. And from Nokia, that's where I actually went and started my first startup as a standalone entrepreneur. All right, so second thing is building your expertise. Um, so it's really important, um, and I think in entrepreneurship, because it is really hard and it takes, you know, on average seven years to get an exit, it, it helps if you know what you're doing. So if you are an expert in something, you're gonna have a leg up against somebody who doesn't. I mean, you hear stories and somebody who is great at e-commerce goes and starts a fintech company and somebody you know, who's great at consumer business does a very successful enterprise business. But I think by and large, if you're really good at something and you apply that expertise to your startup, you're just gonna be faster than your competition. You're gonna solve problems quicker. Um, and probably get to market faster. Um, the second one, the second reason why that's important is that you're also raising money. So as I'm sure many of you know, uh, VCs don't invest in people that they don't know. So, and they also, I mean, actually the point here is also that um, there's an exit, VC is always a concern about execution risk. You know, do you really know what you're doing? What is the risk associated with you actually being successful at what you're doing? So if you're an expert, there's already sort of comfort in looking at your business and knowing that you're gonna be very good at figuring out the problems that are associated with this business. Otherwise, you're gonna have to buy that expertise and that's you know, adding people to your business and potentially you know, slowing you down. Um, and th thirdly, it's, you know, it's, you're in it for a long haul, so it's, it's nice to kind of like, love what you do. And uh, if you're good at something and you really go deep in it, you're gonna be looking at the same problem, you know, day in and day out. It's gonna be the grinding through the minute details of this one problem set. So if you're an expert at it and if you love it, you know, that's just gonna help you. Um, my own experience in that, you know, and then my own experience in this is um, actually going, jumping into something I wasn't expert in. So when I left Nokia, I started my first business and it was called Snaz. And uh, initially, we st I had become an expert in mapping, and we you know, started chasing this problem, and uh, ended up actually chasing this problem all the way to creating a platform for live events. And uh, I can say that I spent countless, hundreds upon hundreds of hours with customers, really understanding the problem, and watching them use our platform, like sitting there and like watching them click through our product. If, um, I think probably, most likely, somebody who came with a, with a background in, in events would have been a lot faster than me. So in hindsight, I can say it's hard, and events are really hard. Um, so thirdly, it's about creating an ecosystem of success. And we're at a conference. Everybody's thinking about networking. And as much as it's great to exchange business cards and link in with people, that's not what I mean. So what I actually mean by that is investing in relationships. And it's important for many, many reasons. Firstly, you get to build your team before you actually build your business. And if you're a developer and you're contributing to open source projects, you, know, you make, meet great people, other developers whose work you respect. If you are a business developer, you do work with partners and you run into good people. And you know, it's, it's really important to keep in touch. And when you actually have that great idea, you wanna build your team, you already know the people you're gonna work with. 
Um, starting early, basically letting people to get to know you. Again, this is important for investors. People don't, you know, meet you and like hand over the check. I think it probably does happen, but it's really, really rare. So one of my actually advisors in my first company and an entrepreneur himself, someone I really respect, he said, um, he said, if I start a business again, and he actually ended up selling his current business for 200 million, he said, I will go to this one investor before I've done anything else. I'm gonna sit down with her and I'm gonna say, give me every reason not to start this business. And if, he can't t if she can't talk me off the ledge, I'm gonna start that business then. So it is, it's again about really you know, keeping in touch and building a relationship with people who are gonna help you. Um, thirdly, it's um, about being thoughtful about give and take. So I get often asked to mentor young entrepreneurs or people who are just starting out, and I'm always happy to lend, you know, lend a hand. Uh, one of the things um, that is important and I think is one of my biggest pet peeves is when I get on the phone and the person who's, um, who's calling me has done absolutely no research. So if you're gonna, so I think it's about being really thoughtful about the time and how you ask for time from people and doing just like the basic level of research about what you try to learn. Um, you know, it's as simple as Google search. If you're gonna talk to someone who's an expert in some domain, you know, go online, you know, spend half a day, educate yourself, because you're gonna get more out of it as well as a result of that. And I think oftentimes when people are just starting out, they feel like, well, I don't have a lot to give, but you do. I think the research aspect is part of it, just, you know, being kind of educated about it before you get on the phone. But it's also, you know, you, know, you meet people, you meet one person here and the second person there, and you say, okay, maybe there's value for the two of them to know each other. Now you can make a valuable introduction. So I think it's, there's many ways to kind of give and take in that sense. And the last point really is, is building a support system. It's really hard, it's really lonely, and nobody's gonna get it, right? If you're a founder of a new company, your friends and family are gonna be like, well, you seem a little busy, you know, what's wrong with you? And, and they don't really understand the day-to-day -day grind, the ups and downs of what you're going through. The people who are gonna understand are gonna be the other founders. And that's gonna be a support system, like to lean on each other, like through good and bad, and also, you know, celebrate your successes. If it doesn't work out, there are people, you know, you can get a beer with and like, they really understand what you've gone through. That's it, thanks very much. Do we have, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Anyone has a question for Mari? You're based in New York now, right? Yes, I am. Do you think you're gonna ever take the talent back home? Um, I'm thinking about that, yeah, yeah. It's really nice to be here. There's tremendous energy. I think we've done really well. Um, in creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem. People are really motivated, so I'm always looking for ways to be involved. Great. Well, yeah. thank you very much for your thank speak. You. Thanks. And let's give Mari a big applause. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have another founder story, um, actually from, uh, from Rainer there. He's, uh, I'm gonna invite you on stage. I actually know Rainer uh, personally from Garage 48 hackathons. We met there and uh, I must say that you're one of the most active kind of, um, it, you're good to have at a hackathon. You're active, you're always listening to the, to the mentors, you're very creative. So you can say about uh, where, where the creativity comes from. You started as an engineer and then moving on to, uh, to building companies and, uh, and, and leading companies. Where does the creativity come from? Well, actually, uh, hey guys, um, first of all, glad to see so many of you uh, here. So glad after, uh, still after the last night's party. Um, <laughs> it's actually a very weird question for me because uh, I was told uh, once by a recruiter who I used to apply for a job uh, that uh, the, idea, uh, the idea of Skillific, that it actually Strike her as a uh, very um, inventive or, uh, or uh, creative idea, considering my profile. <laughs> so, exactly. I, I think she meant it as a as a compliment, but uh, that actually it didn't really uh, hit that way. But I meant it as yeah. a compliment. Just something Thank that you. you don't know. Rainer was uh, actually told me that uh, he was planning to start this uh, this talk with a guitar and a singing, but. Uh, 
Not this time, yeah? Yeah, I, I had a little too little time for a practice because I've been up on stage uh, with a guitar and, and singing for, I think, three times in my life. So I, I thought it would be a more of a shock for me than you. So I, I skipped so it So let's this time. do that next year. But yeah. I, will, I will get off your stage and uh, you. Reiner's stories and you. Thank you. So um, this is half of my life story in about 10 minutes. Uh, um, I actually, um, let's start with the education side. So I'm, I'm an electrical engineer, graduated from Tallinn University of Technology in, um, in 2001, uh, went through this quite tough path uh, in eight and a half years, uh, which was uh, far too long for the five-year curriculum. Um, one of the reasons was that um, that I actually uh, started working for ABB uh, already on, uh, after my second year. Um, worked for ABB for 10 years. Uh, the mountain here is uh, not an accident. Uh, the whole idea was to climb the sort of a mountain of, uh, of uh, career. Uh, after ABB, uh, well, in ABB, the ladder, it, it looked like something uh, starting from screwing together uh, electrical switchboards to to building the uh, uh, world's past, uh, largest uh, wind turbine generator factory uh, with, uh, with a management team of six. Uh, after ABB, I, uh, I moved on to uh, Kalev Chocolate Factory. Some of you may know it. Uh, that was much sweeter, sweeter uh, job. There I developed uh, or focused on developing the, the um, production there. After two years, I got an uh, very strange offer for me because uh, coming from a middle management uh, level, I was offered to actually lead uh, one of uh, very uh, unique companies in Estonia. It has a very diverse uh, portfolio of companies, one of those being uh, Ulemiste City, which is the business campus next to, next to the Tallinn airport. Um, very nice career, sun is shining, there are some clouds, but always you can overcome them. Um, but then one day, what actually happened is that I got tired of climbing. I suddenly felt that I actually wanted to build something, that I wanted to do something myself. I was too much on the delegative uh, mode. So I told my boss, uh, the late Ulo Bernitz, uh, that, uh, sorry, now, today I quit. And that was a big leap into the unknown because, for me, because uh, at first I didn't think that I would become an entrepreneur. So, uh, so what happened was uh, that I actually thought about uh, getting another job, probably a management job, because the cost level, the, the life standard had grown pretty high. You, you want to pay the mortgages, you want to pay for your car leases, etc., etc. And you, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I was thinking about getting another job, but I had somehow set my bar very high, so it didn't really, I didn't really hit, hit the right thing. And interestingly enough, uh, one week, just one week after leaving, uh, leaving uh, Maynard, uh, an idea stroke. <laughs> and uh, again, I'm not so creative person as, as, as maybe um, some may think uh, this was maybe my first true idea in my life that I, I felt that I, I would have to do. Um, so uh, at first it looked something like that. Um, so the idea, is, uh, the idea that struck me was that uh, wouldn't it be great if any of us would actually be able to find out what is the true market value of our skills? For example, if I have worked as a marketing manager or if I have worked as a quality manager or a sales guy, I would be able to pick the skills that are most valuable on the market and focus on these. So, um, and the back thought of there being that, that these uh, skills are then, if they're most valued, meaning they add most value. So we could actually even develop economy through that. Um, it wasn't a business idea in the beginning, uh, it, it was just an idea. I just wanted to somehow improve the world. Um, it took me a while, there were some points about what, how, how I imagined it, and it took me a while to actually uh, to understand that it might be a business. And um, this is something, a mock-up, sort of what it looked like in the beginning, the vision. Um, the problem was that uh, 
I was alone. I'm sort of a lonely founder. So what I decided to do was, uh, I didn't think about this as a startup. So what I decided to do was uh, to find corporate relationships. You know, my background, 16 years in the corporate world. So I'm going for corporate relationships to actually build the things. So if I need salary data to evaluate uh, skills value, I go to the companies in Estonia who actually uh, make salary service and they own the information, so they give it to me, I develop the system, everybody's happy. Well, didn't quite work out this way. I, I, I tried and I tried, uh, spent about one year, still alone. Nothing really happened during this one year. Besides, I ran out of my, my personal savings and, uh, and uh, had to find uh, different freelance jobs to, to finance uh, my living standard. So next round, I start talking to my, my friends that maybe there is a, some guy or some programmer who could actually make the prototype. I can go to the customer, prove it, and then I hit the pedal and then start earning money. It took me two rounds with my friends to, uh, uh, to six, uh, six months rounds with my friends uh, to realize that uh, these guys didn't have enough time uh, to actually uh, help me execute this. Uh, one of them, uh, the first one, uh, he's a father of four kids. Uh, at the time worked in two countries, uh, Estonia and Sweden, flying back and forth. Um, very smart guy and at the time was, uh, was going into a new relationship with a new girlfriend. So um, you can Im imagine how much uh, actual time he had uh, to spend on this. So I didn't get any real commitment from there. Again, I'm alone. And now uh, the next step is actually realizing that, hey, this might be something like, you're talking to people and they're saying like, this is a startup, startup, startup. Okay, what the heck is a startup? So what does it mean exactly? Oh. So you find physical people to do things with you, not going to the corporate side uh, who always demand like 90% of your business for, for your com contribution. So I realize I have to go someplace where I can put a team together fast. So I go to Garage 48 in 2014 in October and voila, a team. Um, this happened really quickly. Uh, and it was a result of, uh, of giving out message all the time that I want to build something, I want to build something, I want to build something, I want to build something. Are you go do you want to build it with me? So some, some people stuck with me. And uh, two months later, we have a nice office in Ulemiste City based on my uh, very co uh, cost-effective uh, solution, based on my uh, earlier relationships with the business campus. And we're celebrating, and uh, that's real champagne, by the way, where I made an in extra investment, and, uh, and we're opening up. And that's a great moment. I, I drove home from the, from the first meeting, team meeting, and I fell actually in love. Like, like the feeling inside was like so thrilling. There are people, there are eight people around me who want to make my idea happen and they are actually willing to put effort into it, put their time on it, in it. And some of them full time, uh, there's one guy, Silver, sitting there who was like relentlessly working on this project for, uh, for uh, months. And um, yeah, we start working and, and at first we sort of imagine that uh, Three to four months, we build the prototype. Um, then, uh, excuse me. Uh, we build the prototype, and then we prove the concept, and so it rolls. Very nice, probably very familiar attitude or thought uh, for you also, or at least a lot of you. So actually, what it took us was 18 months of hard work resulting in something that was almost like ready for market. We were earning some money, uh, so the money comes from the employer's side. So we go to the employers, we have these uh, uh, people who have mapped their skills, so we're offering this to the, to the employer and they, they will subscribe and pay for it. Well, it didn't, didn't really work that easy. Um, and, and at that point, we are in a very critical situation, actually. 
So we need money to continue because none of us are getting paid for 18 months. And uh, we cannot tell anybody that we're desperate because then nobody wants to give us money. So what we do instead is that, uh, that we go to the crowdfunding side. It's less critical, more supportive, the community. And we put the idea out there and say that, hey, we're making some money. So, so um, yeah. And that was a success. <laughs> I have a competition here. So we, you always have to consider competition. So I have two choices now, either to speak louder or wait out. Cool. Um, so, uh, so what happened was that we raised 90K, which is not big money, of course, but uh, for us, it was a very, very good kickoff. First money that we raised from outside. We had invested around 50K ourselves before. So um, what we do now is we really push the bell down. We go and develop the, the, the product to the end. And one thing that we did, and that was pretty risky, was uh, that we took Basically, we went to the crowdfunding, and at the same time, we pivoted. So we already knew that the old model wasn't really working. We need something else. The idea, the foundation was the same, skills, value, but the way we would uh, packet it or, or put it into the package and sell it to the customer, this is, uh, this is something we changed. So uh, a lot of risk involved, but anyhow, we hired more people, great guys, developers, helping us get more speed, of course, burning money faster. And everything starts looking really nice, like beautiful team. Product starts looking like something quite pretty already, like the real thing. We're earning some money, like really going to the customers and we'll actually want the service. OK, I'm willing to pay you. Um, and, and in respect of that, we, we actually had a runway of four to six months after the fundraising, which was extremely short. Uh, we realized that, and so we had two options. I, we, we go and uh, fundraise right away again, or we start earning money. And we chose the later one. So, uh, and, and that was a big risk again. So what started happening was but the goals were really high. So we'd have to make a break even by September, and, and now it's April. Like, um, it's a summertime. HR tend to sleep a bit in summertime. Um, so tough, tough uh, job, and it really started feeling the tension in the team. And uh, retrospectively, I could have handled a lot of thing much, things much better. Could have dealt with the team much, uh, much more. But uh, well, I did my best with the information, with the skills I had at the time. But what happened was that some people left at a very critical stage when we were already ha halfway to the break even, but still, still hadn't made it. And the next thing happens really, really fast. So in three months, I see everything I built in four and half years coming <laughs> crashing down. So we literally crashed. I had a uh, debt of about, in the end, about 50K. Uh, not me personally, but uh, personally I had much more because I, uh, you know, a startup thing. Um, but uh, the company has 50K debt. There are no people to, uh, to, to help me program or uh, complete the pr uh, product. Uh, I'm not able to make money due to that. So everything just stopped. Um, and just as an irony of life, again, I'm sitting alone, looking at the, I don't know, sunset sea, thinking, what the hell? And um, I, I, it's a failure, yeah, OK. I gave up several times. I, I just sat down and thought, sorry, fuck this. I need to do something else. Um, and then next morning I get up and I don't want to do anything else. It's a, it's, this is a thing. 
This is what I want to do. So again, I'm looking for partnerships, not corporate partnerships, but I'm looking for potential investors, potential companies who would be interested in the product. Maybe we can develop it together. I'm looking at the existing investors. By the time after the crowdfunding, we had about 74, I guess. Um, and I'm always halfway. I'm like getting the, I need 60K, I get 30. Okay, you don't start driving through the desert with half a bottle of water, so don't do it. Next scenario, I need 120K, I get 60. Damn, it doesn't work. So, and that went on about eight months, actually. And I'm not gonna be even, I'm not gonna try to explain what it meant, like mentally and emotionally and, and, and like this. So, what next? One month ago, I signed a deal with the uh, biggest uh, labor services provider in Estonia, Finesta, whose name is not so well known, but is actually the biggest. Um, they invested enough for me to pay off debts. They invested enough for the MVP to be uh, completed, which we are starting now. So I'm here today feeling extremely happy that I'm continuing my life's work. So Skillific will prevail. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Do we have any questions for Rainer from the audience? Any comments? Is there a hand? Yes, there's a hand there. What you could do differently? if you have the same idea uh, from the day one? With the knowledge I had then, nothing. Uh, with the knowledge I have now, um, I'd probably let some of my friends talk me faster into the concept that this is actually a potential enterprise and, uh, and uh, to start up, it doesn't mean that you have right away somebody else's 100K as it works in the so-called corporate world that you can actually start doing things without money and, and so move on faster. The speed is the, the thing that I'm maybe, if I regret anything, then this is the one. Yeah. You have one more in the back there. Whoa! <laughs> you mentioned that you had challenges with the team. So how did things work out in the end? Who is on your team now? Very simply, uh, there is no team anymore because the team was taken to the, to the final limit, basically, uh, financially. So everyone has to finance their lives. So what, what happened was when everything stopped and we weren't able to pay anything to our people, they had to find other challenges. And this is what we're doing now. Okay, I hired, hired already back one person to Finesta, but maybe this will so continue. you're rebuilding yeah. the team from scratch, basically? Sorry? You're rebuilding the team from scratch now? Uh, yeah, the, there will be a short concept review with a new investor. Then I will build the MVP by outsourcing. If I see it make, start making money, or if I make it start making money, then, then I will start again rebuilding the team. Is there another one? Do we see a hand? Guess not. Well, I think on this stage it has been said that the Garage 48 is like a platform for failing, right? Like, I'm really happy that you're sharing your story and kind of in the community we talk about it all the time that we need to embrace failure, but does it actually happen? So I think your story is, is a great one to tell and share and actually see that the next step is yeah. always going to be up. Yeah, uh, failure is also always very nice retrospectively. It's, it's being in it is not so nice, but... Uh, <laughs> I can yeah. believe that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.